terrorists. They attack New Zealand. They attack America. They attack any European site, and it's big news. News coverage for terrorist activities in Africa and the Far East, tends to, they tend to get uh, a bit less shrift. While Westerners were still caught up in the Je suis Charlie movement, I am Charlie, um, not that much was said about 150 killed in a Kenyan university in 2015. And even less, perhaps, when associates of the radical Al-Shabaab burst into a Kenyan church in 2012, killing 18 and wounding 60-plus Christians. Je suis Charlie Hebdo. We remember. Garissa? What's that? And I wrote this before this morning's news. Garissa, what's that? Well, on Good Friday, shortly after the attack on the church in Garissa, the head of the Anglican church in Kenya, the most reverend Eliud Wabukala, who actually has a PhD from Toronto, uh, said this, horror is fresh in our minds. Let us not run away or deny it. But stay by the cross. We stay with Jesus, the man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. We share in the grief of Mary, and we share in the grief of those who have been so shockingly bereaved. But as Mary was to discover, we know that this is not the end of the story. Jesus' death upon the cross was not in vain. By his death, death has been destroyed. The stone rolled away and the empty tomb of Jesus assures us that death does not have the last word. As we think of those dear ones who died in Garissa because they were Christian, let us remember the promise of the Lord Jesus that nothing can separate them and us from his love. And we could echo those words this morning. But Wabakula, Wabakala's words are great words of faith. They're words that take us back to the core of Christianity. In the midst of an age and a culture that places all religious beliefs together and suggests that all religions are basically doing the same thing in different idioms, the church comes forth and it invites people to hear one truth, the Easter truth, the truth that Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. And his death and resurrection were God's ways of reconciling the world to himself. It's the truth that there is more to this life than, than this. Easter faith, foundation of Christianity, and against natural tendencies to disbelieve in things supernatural, Christians hold that on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. The ancient apostles' creed tells us he rose in bodily form. And we hold this belief against two sort of tendencies. Now, one is that we overly f physicalize, if I can create a word, uh, this event and reduce it to something like the resuscitation of a corpse, which we see in the Gospels with the story of Lazarus. And um, Jesus' resurrection was different to that of Lazarus. Now, the second thing is that we overly spiritualize an event. That's, that's more a used word, I think. And um, to imagine that Jesus just rose in spirit or, or his soul was raised, leaving the body behind. Jesus' resurrection seems to have been beyond these two things if we follow the Gospels. If we read them carefully, the, the old, the, the body of Christ was raised, but it was transformed into something something quite new, something better, something eternal. 
If you take a look at these verses in John chapter 20, and indeed that whole chapter, you'll notice some curious things about, about Jesus after the resurrection. Mary, for instance, didn't recognize him. At first, how was he hidden from her through her tears? Or, or was there something different about him? We can note that the disciples, uh, John makes the point of telling us a little later in that chapter that when they were gathered in the room with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish authorities, Jesus stood among them. Something different there. Something more spiritual. And yet, we can also note that, that Jesus was eventually recognized by Mary and later in that chapter by Thomas. And we can note that Jesus speaks to his disciples and he tells Thomas to look upon the nail marks in his hands and places his finger in his side. But there were differences and there were bits of continuity with Jesus' early existence. And so it's not the same, it's not the same old physicality, it's not just some sort of spiritual thing because the, the tomb was empty. And as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, what was perishable was changed into something imperishable, it was different. Now maybe we shouldn't be too quick to actually try to define what this resurrection was like. But um, Christians throughout all the ages, like Bishop Wabukala, have affirmed God's promise that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead and that those who follow him will go into God's eternal kingdom. In one of his earliest letters, we, we hear Paul talking about this, and he has such assurance about it, it's, it's unbelievable. But we would not have you ignorant, he says, concerning those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no, no hope. So he's speaking here to the Thessalonians about friends of theirs who had died but were followers of Christ. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. And he says, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then those who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord and comfort one another with those words. Paul himself, he's, he's imprisoned. He's writing a letter to the Philippian Christians. And he, he's... He, Whatever Christ has done affects him so greatly that he is in prison, facing death, and he says this, it's with hope that I shall not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me, to me, to live is Christ, to die is gain. If it is to be life in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to part, to depart and be with Christ. That is far better. Whatever happened for Paul, he had this assurance. He had this Easter faith. And you think that these things would give us, as Christians in the 21st century, a lot of assurance. But it's hard. It's very hard. Some of the nicest people you believe, or you, that you know, um, find it hard to believe. And uh, when the Apostle Paul traveled to Athens, for, uh, for instance, he talks to um, a bunch of people the wise people there, and he tells them about Jesus' resurrection from the dead, and they start to laugh and giggle, and there's derision goes on. Some biblical scholars today, like John Dominic Crossan, uh, they've confessed, I do not think that anyone anywhere at any time brings dead people back to life. 
Thus, there are people associated with the church that are struggling with those, this whole concept. I read something this week that was kicking around the church, and it suggests that we need to reinterpret Easter. And the writer makes a case that uh, based on the dates of Paul's writings and the Gospels, which were later, uh, that the notion of a physical resurrection was just that. It was just a notion. And it didn't really come into play until late in the first century. But if, if you read it closely with some knowledge of biblical studies behind you, this, this writer just doesn't seem to be aware of some things and doesn't seem to be aware that the assumed dates of the Gospels, what they mean is not that the final edition of those Gospels came from that. that or it is that the final edition of the Gospels came at that time, but the, the writer doesn't recognize that there was a rich history of tradition behind that. There was this uh, rich history, uh, for instance, in, in John's Gospel, which they assume the final uh, edition came in 90 AD, 60 years after Jesus' death, that... Um, this, this assumption is that just sort of came out of space, out of a vacuum in that, at that time. But it didn't. Biblical scholars who study this stuff talk about John maybe having gone through five different editions over many, many years. And before that, there, there was this oral tradition that goes back to Jesus. And if you study what oral tradition is within that Hebrew environment, and especially in an environment where there are rabbis and students, Jesus was called a rabbi, disciples, the tradition was semi-fixed, even though it was oral. They had incredible memories uh, that they used uh, to great effect. And, and this isn't to say that there were differences in the gospel, but with this article that was kicking around the church, it, it just means that that writer has really taken a very facile approach to it, a simplistic approach. But I don't want to continue with that. That'll bore you. It's heady stuff. Um, one of the things that encourages me about the gospel accounts is this, just the way that they, they don't delve into myth. They don't go into um, cosmic battles and that sort of thing to describe the resurrection. The gospel just... they. It portrays men and women struggling to understand something that has happened in their time and their space, in their lives. And it wasn't easy because resurrections don't happen. Or at least they don't happen every day. And they're struggling to understand this. And uh, so Thomas, for instance... Jesus appears to the other 10 disciples and they tell him about it. And Thomas says, you've got to be kidding. You don't believe that. I don't believe that. And unless I see the nail marks in his hands and place my fingers in his side, I'm not going to believe this. And it wasn't until Christ appeared to him that he falls down and he says, my Lord and my God. wasn't easy for Mary either. For whatever the reason, she didn't recognize Jesus at first because dead men don't rise every day. And perhaps she was turned away. I don't know what it was, but initially she didn't recognize. And then when he spoke to her, he said the word Mary. She got it. And says, Rabuni, my teacher, my rabbi, Rabuni. And it wasn't easy for Saul, who became Paul. If you think about his life before he became a Christian, he was a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee. And he was actually charged by the high priest in Jerusalem to go out and gather up Christians and bring them in for trial and sometimes death. And he's out doing this. He hates the very word Jesus. He's out doing this, 
And suddenly he's on his way to Damascus to gather up some Christians from there. And Christ appears to him. And it changes everything that he thinks and believes. And he goes from antagonism towards Christianity, towards writing one of these phrases, one of these sentences that we read a little earlier about his belief in Christ and the belief in the resurrection. And for him to die was better than to be with Christ. And I'm encouraged by all this because something must have happened to these people. They're ordinary people. Something must have happened for them to go and give their lives to this. Sometimes face martyrdom. You don't just stand up there and when you're facing death and proclaim Christ is risen when you know it isn't true. Something happened. If it wasn't the risen Christ, I don't know what it was. But you know what? I could talk to you about this till next Easter. And I could uh, make positive arguments for the resurrection, and I could tear apart critics, and it wouldn't matter. I happen to think that there's pretty good evidence for a resurrection. But at the end of the day, it still takes faith. At the end of the day, it still takes faith. It takes faith to believe that one time in the history of the world, God acted and raised someone from the dead. It takes faith to affirm Jesus' words that he has gone to prepare a place for us. It takes faith to sing, On Christ the solid rock I stand. It takes faith to sing and believe, Will your anchor hold in the storms of life? It takes faith to sing, Christ the Lord is risen today. And actually believe it in here. Sometimes we don't talk enough about faith. But that faith is the hope and the foundation of Christianity. I'll end with this. I know we've had a long service today, but one of my father's uh, best friends, Dr. J. Stanley McQuaid, passed away this year in January. Stanley was absolutely brilliant. He had degrees in everything. He had degrees in art, he had degrees in law, degrees in philosophy, degrees in theology, degrees in medicine. And uh, he was brilliant, and he seemed to have boundless energy. He was one of those people who just had no shortage. I remember spending time with him, uh, probably the mid-80s, and he was teaching in the law school at Campbell University in North Carolina. And uh, he worked there by day. By night, he was the head of the emergency department at the Lillington Hospital. And I wondered, when do you sleep, Stanley? And he said, well, I get a couple of hours in between patients. And uh, I remember chatting with him on the phone when he was in semi-retirement. And uh, he took this little Methodist church, in, which would be a United Church if it were in Canada, little Methodist church in, in Newcastle, lovely seaside village in County Down in Northern Ireland for two years. And while he was there, he was still taking a full teaching load in North Carolina. And he was communicating with the students via the internet. And then he finally did retire from the Lynch Professor of Philosophy of Law at Campbell in 2015, and he passed away this January, as I said. I spoke to him about 10 days or so before he passed, 
and uh, it wasn't a long conversation because he tired easily. Um, before we hung up, however, he said to me, David, it's okay. I'm at peace with this. I know where I'm going. And I know what he meant. Because he had a strong faith. And that is our faith. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you this day. We are a people of faith. Called to be a people of faith. But sometimes it's difficult. And sometimes we encounter things that would lead us in other ways and into other thoughts. But I pray that you would encourage us and help us to be your church, to be ourselves founded on the gospel of Christ and the power of the resurrection. Lord, give us faith. Amen.